Hey, are you ready to go into the wild with the E A G E A G? See them mangrove day, protect them. When you walk with your things, don't let them look out for the birds and the snakes. Don't scare them. We're going on a wildlife journey to save them. Who you rolling with? No one does it like. Who cares for the coral reefs and the beach and the seas and even the trees? Who you rolling with? No one does it like. Who cares the most for the turtles and fishes and trees and all for the coral? Into the wild, into the wild, no, into the wild. Funding for this initiative was provided by the Elkhorn Marine Conservancy, dedicated to enhancing the resilience and local stewardship of Antigua's marine ecosystems through restoration, collaborative management, and conservation. Welcome to Into the Wild with the EAG, our virtual field trip experience that takes you on a fun and interactive adventure into ecosystems found right here in Antigua, Barbuda, and Redondo. My name is Janella, and I work with the Environmental Awareness Group, or EAG. Over the next few episodes, I'll be taking you on an underwater adventure with our partners, the Elkhorn Marine Conservancy. We're going to take you to get a closer look at the marine plants and animals found around our beautiful Twin Island state. Come meet the rest of the team. Hi, my name is Shanna Challenger. And I'm Nathan Wilson, and we both work at the EAG. We are so excited to take you into the wild with us today. We'll be giving you an up close and personal look at one of our most important ecosystems in the ocean, coral reefs. You'll be learning about the amazing things corals do for us and the environment and why it is crucial that we protect these special creatures who defend the shores of Antigua, Barbuda, Redonda and the offshore islands. Get your snorkeling and diving gear and get ready for a fun-filled learning experience that allows you to connect with our underwater ecosystems like never before. Let's go! But wait! Since we're heading to our offshore islands, we have to do a quick biosecurity check before leaving the mainland to make sure the wildlife found there remain in a pest-free environment. Rewind! Step 1. Shake your bags out. Check the inside, the pockets. Make sure there are no holes. Make sure all your belongings are well secured and pack food into sealed containers. Step 2. Clean your shoes. Check your socks and the soles, laces and tongue of your shoes for dirt and seeds. Make sure they're properly clean before leaving for the offshore islands. Step 3. If you're camping, check your tents and sleeping bags for any seeds, dirt or eggs as well. Once thoroughly shaken out, seal them tightly in a bag for the journey so that nothing can get to them again. Step 4. Finally, whether you are traveling by boat or by helicopter, be sure to check them before leaving the mainland. The offshore islands are a special place and we don't want any small critters to store them. Okay, now that we know we are pest free, we're about to explore a coral nursery off the coast of Green Island. Green Island is found in Antigua and Barbuda's largest marine protected area, the NEMA or Northeast Marine Management Area. You may remember from primary school that the NEMA is home to our very own critically endangered Antiguan racer. But did you know that it holds the largest area of mangroves in Antigua? This marine ecosystem, especially in the Nemo, is supported by seagrass beds and coral reefs. There's evidence that there used to be a large amount of coral in the area, but that has drastically changed over time. We'll get into why coral reefs are critical to our survival. But for now, let's just have a chat with Molly and Jen from the Elkhorn Marine Conservancy. Hi, I'm Molly. And I'm Geneviève, but you can call me Jen. We're marine biologists with the EMC, or the Elkhorn Marine Conservancy. The EMC is named after the iconic Elkhorn coral that was once abundant throughout Antigua and Barbuda's coastal ecosystems. 
We bring together people who want to revive and protect the island's marine ecosystems in a number of ways. The coral reef nursery that you're going to see on this adventure is just one of the ways that many people have worked together for marine conservation and the NEMA. This coral nursery consists of these tiny animals known as coral polyps. Wait, y'all didn't know corals were animals. Maybe we need a few more minutes in the classroom with Alex. She's the EAG's Antigua Marine Conservation Program Coordinator, and she can probably shed some light on things before we get in the water. Hi guys, my name is Alex Fireman, and I also work at EAG doing marine conservation. I think I can clear some of that up for you before you dive into our crystal clear waters. For one thing, there are some common misconceptions about coral polyps. The biggest misconception is that people often think corals are plants, but they are in fact animals. This is probably because corals look very similar to plants and rocks. So if it looks like a rock and it feels like a rock, then it must be... So firstly, let's establish that corals are living things. They produce offspring through reproduction and generate waste products through excretion. They also require a source of nutrition, which they can use to grow or develop. What else makes them different from plants? Corals are really interesting because they share some similarities with plants, although they're actually animals. For instance, coral polyps do not make their own food, which is a very animal-like thing to do. But like plants, they cannot move from one place to another. Corals actually get most of their nutrients from algae, but we'll get into that later. Thanks for clearing that up, Alex. This is the perfect time to practice your understanding of the differences between plants and animals using what you just learned about corals. Turn to activity one in your booklets. So, now that we know corals are animals, let's talk about what type of animals they actually are. One, corals are invertebrates, meaning they are animals with no backbone or spine. They are also cold-blooded, so they cannot regulate their own body temperature. 2. They all belong to a diverse group of animals called Cnidaria. Cnidaria have a soft, clear body that is shaped like a cylinder. There is a mouth at one end that is surrounded by a ring of tentacles. Because of the unique shape of their bodies, both food and waste enter and exit the coral polyp through the mouth. Ew! They poop and eat from the same hole? Tom! Yes, that's right. The coral polyp uses its tentacles to capture food like plankton that floats by in the water. Their tentacles also have stinging cells called nidocytes that act as defense against predators and help capture prey. While coral polyps can use their tentacles to capture food, this method is not the most effective way for them to survive. And so, interestingly, they have developed a relationship with algae that began 160 million years ago, known as symbiosis. Wow, I wish I could have a relationship that would last that long. Do you? Before you rush into that relationship, Nathan, let's go shore side with Sherelle first so we can find out what that commitment would really look like. What is up, you guys? I'm Sherelle, the EAG's Science Communications Officer. So, what is symbiosis? It is a close relationship between two different kinds of organisms or living things. Now, there are different types of symbiotic relationships, but we are only going to be focusing on one. Mutualism. Mutualism involves both organisms benefiting from the relationship. For example, you may have seen an egret at some point, locally known as galling, on top of a cattle's back. Both animals mutually benefit as the egret eats the ticks on the cow, providing food for the bird and relief for the cow. So, it's a win-win. Hmm, that kind of relationship sounds good to me. Anyways, back to coral. The algae is called zooxanthellae. That's zoo, zan, fel, e. These microscopic organisms live within the tissues of coral polyps. The polyps provide the zooxanthellae with shelter and a source of carbon dioxide through respiration. 
In turn, the zooxanthellae produce sugars that provide nutrition to both the zooxanthellae and the coral. The majority of coral's energy comes from zooxanthellae. The zooxanthellae is also responsible for vibrant colors associated with healthy tropical coral reefs, since coral polyps themselves are transparent. Yes, that's right. The corals themselves have no color. The zooxanthellae have pigments such as chlorophyll that give the coral its vibrant colors and also lets us know that the coral is healthy. That was a lot of information and a lot of new terms. Take some time to review with your class. You might be wondering how coral polyps wind up here. Polyps settle on hard substrates like a rock or the skeleton of another coral reef. They then secrete a sticky substance to attach to the substrate. Think of it as a strong binding glue that once connected is really difficult to remove. Once attached to a hard surface, the coral polyp makes its own internal skeleton made of calcium carbonate. This is called the coralite. The polyp lives in the coralite and can even pull itself into the hard structure for protection from predators. As coral polyps grow, they also create larger exoskeletons also made from secreted calcium carbonate. These secretions create the stony masses we know as coral reefs. This whole structure serves as a protective barrier for the soft-bodied coral polyps. Turn to your activity booklets and get ready for the Battle of the Polyps. Now that we've learned how corals build their reefs, let's move on to coral reproduction. Wait a second. If corals cannot move since they're stuck to a rock, how do they reproduce? Well, corals are able to reproduce or make more of themselves through both sexual and asexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction is an exchange of gametes or eggs and sperm between coral polyps which results in a fertilized egg. Most sexual reproduction in corals happens through the process of broadcast spawning. Broadcast spawning? Yes, this is when the coral colonies in an area release or broadcast sperm and eggs into the water around them. Eventually, the eggs and sperm will mix and meet in the water to form a fertilized egg that further develops into free-floating larvae called planulae. Planulae will attach themselves to the seafloor, then develop into coral polyps that eventually form their own colonies. Ah, the circle of life! On the other hand, Asexual reproduction involves parent coral polyps becoming large enough to expand their colony by a process called cloning. Here, the polyps will generate exact replicas or clones of themselves to build their colony. Corals are making clones of themselves? They are indeed. Corals also undergo fragmentation, where an entire branch of coral breaks off and colonizes on another hard substrate. However, there are downsides to this method of reproduction. Sexual reproduction produces polyps with genetic information from two parents. In cloning, the child polyp is an exact genetic copy of the original. This reduces genetic diversity. Genetic diversity is important because it allows species to adapt to changing environments. Wow, I'm amazed that such simple animals have such a complicated life story. Out on the reef, we see many different types of corals. Let's consult with our resident coral experts, Molly and Jen, to learn more about these different species. While there are many different species of coral, some of the most important species you can find around Antigua and Barbuda are elkhorn coral and staghorn coral. Elkhorn coral has thick, robust, golden tan or pale brown branches with white tips. The branches appear flattened and resemble elk antlers, which give the coral their name. Staghorn coral branches are similar in color, but they're thinner and cylindrical, resembling deer antlers. Both staghorn and elkhorn coral used to be abundant in the Caribbean, but now they are critically endangered species, which means they have an extremely high risk of going extinct in the immediate future. And we really don't want to lose these species because their incredible branching shapes are so important for coral reef ecosystems. And doesn't that mean that they're important to us humans too? Yes, let's see how in episode two. We hope that you had fun exploring these amazing reefs today as much as we did. Until next time. Hey, 
Are you ready to go into the wild? With the E A G E A G See them mangrove they protect them When you walk with your things don't